uh, those of you that are new. As I mentioned last night, we uh, were talking in chapel last week about living for the glory of God. We're going to continue to do that this week. And sort of a, a verse that was our, our, our theme to guide us was 1 Corinthians 10, 31, where it says, whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. God calls us to live for His glory. It's why we're here. It's our purpose. And this morning, as we continue to think about living for the glory of God, we're going to talk about an issue that affects every single one of us. It's an area of life that all of us have to manage and all of us have to deal with. But before we get there, I just want to wake your brain up a little bit this morning because I know it's Monday. I know you guys were up talking last night. I know you didn't get as much sleep as you should have. I didn't either. But I just want us to think about um, some dangerous combinations. What do you think about when you think about dangerous combinations? Anybody got a dangerous con? Yes. Pepsi and Mentos. Pepsi and Mentos, yes. That's a pretty cool trick you can, can do. Yes? Gasoline, vapor, and a match. Gasoline, vapor, and a match. That could be dangerous. Alex? Randy and his trombone. Randy and his trombone. Oh, that was harsh. Harsh, harsh, harsh. That's so true. But true. All right. Well, I, I thought of a few. Bleach and ammonia, uh, if you've ever tried that one. You may not be here. Um, <laughs> Uh, texting and driving can be a dangerous combination. I know some of you have done that. All right. Ignorance and power. That can be a bad combination. Yeah. Anger and alcohol. <laughs> bad combination. This one came from uh, my trip to Peru last summer. <laughs> Literally, uh, for you that are, that are new this week, I, I mentioned last uh, week that last summer I had the opportunity to, to go to Peru and spend a week in the Amazon uh, helping build a church in a village. I'm actually get, going back uh, this August. Looking forward to that. But literally, while I was there in the village, there were three-year-olds that would walk around with machetes. And I thought, whew, this is not safe. So it paid to be really nice to those three-year-olds. Um, the last dangerous combination I want to warn you about is me and no coffee. All right? So you see I have it close by. And uh, Miss Davis, Amy, my sister, who was just playing Prelude for you, made me my coffee this morning. So, so she's, she's a great sister. She takes care of me. She sends me a Facebook message when it's ready so I can go up to her room and get it. There are a lot of dangerous combinations. We've mentioned a few, and I know we could take the rest of chapel talking about them, but there's one that I want to focus on this morning. The Bible says that the hardest thing for us to control in life is also the most powerful part of our life, and that's our tongue. It's pretty interesting. The hardest thing for us to control is the most powerful thing in our life. And if we're going to live for the glory of God, we have to figure out how to get control of that little thing in our mouth. Now, obviously, I'm not talking literally about your tongue, but I'm talking about our words, our mouth, what we say and what we speak. Words have tremendous power. And if we're going to live for the glory of God, we have to manage our mouths. Has your mouth ever got you in trouble? Anybody? All right. Have you ever said anything you regretted? All right. We've all been there. This is something we all can identify with. This is something we all can be on the same page with because it's something that affects every single one of us. Our words have tremendous power. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Your tongue, your words have incredible power and incredible influence. They can bring pleasure or they can bring pain. They can bring delight or they can bring destruction. They can heal or they can maim. They can comfort or they can kill. Your words have incredible power and incredible influence. And if we're going to live for the glory of God, we need to figure out how to manage our mouth. Because the tendency by nature is to lean towards the death side and to bring destruction and evil with our mouth. But God wants you, through His power and through His grace, to be able to use your mouth for His glory and to use your mouth to bring not only blessing to God, but blessing to others and encouragement. And so, thinking about our words, they're powerful. Your spoken words are powerful. Your written words are powerful. Your emailed words are powerful. Your Facebook words are powerful. Your texted words are powerful. They all have power and influence. How many of you, when you were growing up, or maybe even last week, 
when you were getting ready to come, had your parents say, watch your mouth. Anybody? All right, how many of you were told to watch your mouth at some point in life? All right. How many of you, when you were told that, either were tempted to or did say something sarcastic back to your parents? All right. A few. All right, raise your hand if you actually did it. All right. Now raise your hand if you were tempted to do it but were too scared. All right, a few of you. All right, there's just something about it. You know, they say, watch your mouth, and you're like, well, I can't see it, you know. <laughs> it's just like we can't help it, can we? When it comes to our words, sometimes what comes out of our mouth shocks even us, doesn't it? Sometimes what comes out of our mouth even shocks us. And we ask that question, where did that come from? Or I'll hear people say, well, excuse my French. And I'm like, hmm, I didn't know I knew French. I knew more, more language than I know because I recognize that word. You see, the problem with telling someone to watch their mouth isn't just that they might say something sarcastic back to you, but it really doesn't address the root of the problem, does it? Because if it was just watching our mouth, we could all control our tongue. But the Bible says, and James says, the tongue is the most difficult thing to control in life. It says if you can control your mouth, you can control your whole life. See, when it comes to our words, our mouth and our tongue really aren't the problem. Our tongue is what gets the blame, but our tongue doesn't act alone, does it? Our tongue doesn't do its work alone. Our tongue has a partner in crime. And its partner in crime, its wingman, its accomplice, is the heart. I want you to take your Bible this morning, and we're going to look at a few different passages, but Luke chapter 6, verse 45, is where we're going to launch from, and we're going to look at several verses this morning. But Jesus spoke often about the tongue's partner in crime, the tongue's influencer, and his words give us insight about where our words come from. So Luke chapter 6, verse 45, as Jesus talks about the fact that our words have tremendous power and tremendous influence. So we've been told to watch our mouth. But Jesus said this, The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. I want you to narrow in on that, that last line right there. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. If you ever wonder, where did that come from? Where did that, those words that just seem to jump out of my mouth come from? Where did those hurtful words, where did those cutting words, where did they come from? Well, they came from your heart. Because it's out of the overflow of your heart that the mouth speaks that Jesus said. When it comes to your words, the heart of the matter is your heart. And you know, our, our words are one of the truest indicators of what's really in our heart. The words that you speak every day, the words that you text, the words that you write, the words that you Facebook, they are the truest indicator of what's really in your heart. And our words matter. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Jesus cares about what you say. Matthew chapter 12 verses 35 through 37. Jesus says, I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they've spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. And that statement alone ought to make us step back and realize what I say, our words, my words, they matter. And Jesus cares about what comes out of your mouth. And what comes out of your mouth was first lodged in your heart. And that's what God cares most about. The Apostle Paul, when addressing the issue of our mouth, said this. He said in Ephesians 4.29, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, I, I don't want us to think about that for a moment. That word there, unwholesome, literally means rotten. How many of you have ever bit into something and then realized it was rotten? All right, it's a pretty gross thing, isn't it? It's, you know, or how many of you have ever went to get a potato and found out that it had went bad? All right? That's, is, there's not many smells worse than a rotting potato, is there? 
Now we have a lot of potato farms where I live in Florida and at the end of the season they take all the potatoes that they've culled out and they dump them like in big piles. So if you can imagine what one rotten potato smells like, thousands of them smell even worse. And that's really the idea here that Paul's addressing in this verse. He says, don't let any unwholesome, rotten talk come out of your mouth. We've all had some rotten words come out of our mouth, haven't we? But then he goes on, he says, it's not just about not saying bad things or rotten things. He says, say what is helpful for building others up. Your words have incredible power, not just to do bad, not just to destroy, but to bring life and to encourage and to bless. It's as though that they may benefit those who listen. When it comes to unwholesome talk, there's all kinds of unwholesome talk. But there's one that is particularly destructive. And I want to address that for just a minute. Now, I'm going to make you guess what it is. I have a riddle for you. Are you guys ready for a riddle? Monday morning too early for a riddle? All right, listen carefully and I'll see if you can get it. The question is, who am I? I have no respect for justice. I maim without killing. I break hearts and ruin lives. I'm cruel and malicious and gather strength with age. The more I'm quoted, the more I'm believed. I flourish at every level of society. My victims are helpless. They cannot protect themselves against me because I have no name and no face. To track me down is impossible. The harder you try, the more elusive I become. It's never the same. I topple governments and ruin marriages. I destroy careers and cause heartache and sleepless nights. I wreck churches and separate Christians. I spawn suspicion and generate grief. I make innocent people cry. Who am I, you ask? Yes. Yes. Uh, gossip. gossip is correct. Gossip. It's something we've all experienced and more than likely we've all participated in. And God has a lot to say about gossip. When it comes to rotten talk, gossip is one of the worst. Because at first it doesn't sound rotten, does it? It's just a tidbit of delicious information. Listen to the way Solomon described gossip. He said in Proverbs 18 verse 8, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. It's like, it's like this perfect little bite of food, this most delicious little bite that you can imagine. I just want you to think like your, of your favorite food right now. All right? Just imagine your favorite food. Can you do that for a minute? All right? Jonathan's excited. <laughs> I can see the look in his eyes. Now imagine how good that tastes. And Solomon says, that's what gossip is like in the beginning. It tastes amazing. And it doesn't seem rotten at all, does it? But it says they go down into the inmost parts and it affects us. We're quick to participate in what we have personally experienced to be painful. And it destroys people's lives. I want to challenge you to realize the serious nature of gossip. Alright, I know we've all gossiped. I've gossiped, you've gossiped. We don't have to pretend, right? We, we can get past that. But I want you to realize it is something that destroys people's lives. And your tongue, your mouth, your words have incredible power. And if you're going to live for the glory of God, if I'm going to live for the glory of God, I have to learn to let my mouth become under the spirit of God's influence and allow my heart to be filled with His spirit so that I'm not tempted to cut people down, to hurt or to injure. You know, sometimes it makes us feel a little bit better in the moment to tear somebody else down. Sometimes it makes us feel a little bit better about ourselves if we can cast somebody else in, in a, a light that's less than flattering. But I want you to realize that, that that's something that God considers to be very serious because He's called you to build others up. He's called you to use words that edify and encourage and lift up, not words that cut or hurt or injured. The Bible calls those words rotten. And it's not just gossip. It might be foul or offensive language that you use. It could be all kinds of things. The Bible says those things God will hold us accountable for. 
Words have incredible power. How many of you have ever heard that sticks and stones will what? Remember. But words will what? Alright. Is that a lie? Yes. yes. Alright. I think the person that came up with that was deaf. <laughs> Why? Because words have incredible power and all of us have been hurt by words. How many of you, just raise your hand and just say, I've been hurt at some time by, by words. Alright. Words have incredible power. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The spoken word, the written word, the email word, the Facebook word, all have incredible power. Gossip is a particularly troubling sin. But James says this in James 3, 5. He says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Your tongue likes to brag about how powerful it is. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person and sets the whole course of one's life on fire. And it is set on fire by hell. All right, by nature, your tongue is an instrument of evil. All right, by nature, your tongue will cause death. We all have sin. We've all been corrupted by sin, and our tongue particularly so. And by nature, your tongue is an instrument of evil. It will cut and destroy. It will harm. It will injure and hurt. And if you're going to live for the glory of God, if I'm going to live for the glory of God, we have to learn to manage our mouth. We have to deal with the mouth. And the heart of the issue as Jesus pointed us to, is the heart. It's the heart. Out of the overflow of your heart, your what? Your mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus also said this. He says, but the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. And these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. Isn't it pretty amazing when Jesus talks about the things that come out of our heart? He says there's evil thoughts. Then he says murder. All right, we, we all agree murder's wrong, right? It's the, it's the sin that you never want committed against you, right? You with me? All right, we all believe in the sixth commandment, all right? We, we are sixth commandment people. We get that. Murder. Adultery. You know, being unfaithful, cheating on your spouse. Yeah, I get that. That's evil. That's wrong. Sexual immorality. Yep, I agree with that. Theft. Yeah, no one... I mean, how many of you had something stolen from you before? All right. It feels terrible, doesn't it? Even if it wasn't a, a, a huge thing, there's just something about us that feels violated. So we get that. We're like, theft. Yep, that's definitely evil. But then he says false testimony. Lying. I know you've lied before. All right. I've lied before. We're a room full of liars this morning. Be careful who you trust. <laughs> Just kidding. And then he says slander, gossip, cutting somebody down behind their back. Isn't it interesting that he includes these sins of our mouth with the big things like murder, and stealing, and adultery? You know, we have a tendency sometimes to categorize sin in our life, right? And we're like, those are really big sins, and, and these are little sins, you know. So these little sins are okay. I just stay away from the really big ones, right? And if I stay away from the big sins, if I have my little list of my five big sins that I don't do, then I'm okay. And in God's heart and God's mind, it doesn't work like that. If we're going to live for the glory of God, if you're going to live for the glory of God, and you've been called to live for the glory of God, if you're going to do that... You need to manage your mouth. And the secret to cleaning up your mouth isn't soap, all right? I won't ask you if you've ever had your mouth washed out with soap. But, all right, thank you. Thank you for just going ahead and telling me anyway. Not a pleasant experience, and maybe it was a useful tool to help you realize I shouldn't say that around my mom or dad anymore. But it really doesn't change your mouth, does it? It really doesn't fix the problem. Because the problem isn't so much here as it is here. The secret to cleaning up your mouth is the power 
and presence of God at work in your heart and life. It's the transforming power of God. If you are here with us last week, we talked about the need for the gospel, the transformation that God brings through the gospel to be ongoing in our life. That it's not just about getting saved. It's not just about punching a ticket to heaven. It's the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is that we are sinners separated from a holy God, but that holy God came to us. He sent His Son into the world. He lived a sinless life, a life that you couldn't live. He died a sacrificial death, the death you deserve to die. He rose from the dead. He offers you forgiveness of your sin. He offers you the opportunity to experience living relationship with Himself. And that relationship is to be marked by transformation that occurs from the inside out. Not trying harder. Not, not being better, but being transformed by the power of God. And it's the transforming power of God that changes the way that we talk. James says this, he says, those who consider themselves religious. He says, if you consider yourself a, a, a religious person and yet you do not keep a tight rein on your tongue, you deceive yourselves and your religion is worthless. Our relationship with Jesus should change the way that we talk. And if we are really followers of Jesus Christ, if we're people who have experienced His power and His grace and His mercy, it ought to be reflected in the way that we talk. And for you that were here last week, I, I mentioned a little bit about that was one of the big struggles in my life. Because as I was trying to live out my life, I wanted to fit in. And I thought using words that were rotten and unwholesome would make me fit in better. And I, re you know, I have a lot of regrets in life. There's a lot of things I would have done differently as I look back. But one of my deepest regrets is the words that I chose to use. Because once you say them, you can never get them back. You can never pull them back in. You can never undo them. You can apologize and you can ask for forgiveness, but you never get them back. Once they leave, once you hit send, they're gone forever. And I don't want you to live with those sort of regrets. And so I just want to give you some practical thoughts this morning. A little math management 101. Math, actually. Did I say math? You don't want any math lessons from me, trust me. Once I get past like 2 plus 2, it gets confusing for me. So, no math lessons here, but math lessons. Math Management 101. Just three things real quickly, some real practical things for you, because I, I want this to be something that you can take and think about and practice. So, number one, if you're going to manage your mouth, you've got to guard your heart. Because it's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. It's the things that we allow into our heart that cause us to say the things that we do. Solomon said this in Proverbs 4.23. He says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it affects everything that you do. What you take into this heart will influence what comes out of your mouth. The things that you watch, the music that you listen to, the people that you hang around with, the way that they talk. You ever notice that when you spend a lot of time with someone, you start to talk like them? How many of you are already starting to talk like your roommate? All right. They're influencing you. All right. I, I grew up in New Jersey, but then I spent nine years in Virginia, and I had a roommate from South Central Virginia, and we were roommates for five years, and you know, after like two weeks, I was saying y'all and stuff like that. And I, I swore I would never say anything like that. Things that we're around, the things that we take in, they influence us. All right? Guard your heart. Protect your heart. Not only from the bad things, but fill your heart with the good things. Fill your heart with God's Word. Fill your heart with God's truth. It will change the way that you talk. Number two, not only guard your heart, but pray. We need the power of God. If we're going to talk differently, we must have God's power. And we can access God's power through prayer. Psalm 19 14 is a great prayer to pray every day. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. How differently would our conversations go if we prayed that every day? If you pray that every day, God, let the words of my mouth today, let the meditation of my heart, may the things that I think about be pleasing to you. When Jesus taught us to pray, in what we call the Lord's Prayer. And we, we looked at that last week as we talked about tuning our hearts. But he told us to pray, Hallowed be your name. Or literally, may your name be holy. And so one of the things that you can pray every day is, God, may your name be holy today. May I worship you today. And God, may your name be holy in my mouth. May your name be holy in my conversations, in my communication. Number three, Choose to use your mouth to bring glory to God. 
So, Proverbs 16, 23 says, A wise man's heart guides his mouth, and his lips promote instruction. A wise man's heart guides his mouth, and his lips promote instruction. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've been called to live and talk differently. You've been called to live for the glory of God. You've been called to use your tongue to bring life and not death. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I don't want you just not to say bad things or bad words. I don't want you to just not gossip. I want you to use your words every day to build up to do what Paul said in Ephesians 4.32, to edify, to encourage, to bring life. Your words have such incredible power. Every day you have the opportunity to use your words to bless others, to encourage others, and to lift others up. And God wants to use your words to bring death, I mean to bring life, and not death. <laughs> Caught myself. Just shows how hard it is to control your tongue. If you can control your tongue, you can live for the glory of God. And that's what God calls you. When grace fills your hearts, it will flow from your lips. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I just come before you. And Father, I thank you for your grace in our lives. And Father, I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that you give us and call us to live for your glory. Father, we don't deserve to live for your glory. We deserve to be objects of your wrath. But yet you choose in your kindness and your love to show us grace and mercy, forgiveness and eternal life. And Father, I pray that that, that reality and that relationship that you've called us to would cause us to want to talk differently. We all struggle with our mouths. We all struggle with our words. But Father, I pray that you would help us to fill our hearts with your truth and your spirit and your life so that our lips would bring praise and glory and honor to you, that our talk wouldn't be rotten, but it would be wholesome and encouraging and nourishing and building others up. And Father, I pray that you teach us to use our mouths for your glory. Father, so that you would be honored and so that we would be able to use our words to bring life and encouragement and blessing to others. Forgive us when we fail you. Help us to be aware. And Father, give us grace to talk in a way that honors you. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.